All right, we're in 1 Timothy 3. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7. Uh, just as a reminder, that next Sunday night is going to be our time of fellowship. Uh, that'll be our welcoming time with Charlie, his wife, Ann, uh, Addie, as we just welcome them, have a time of fellowship to get to know them. So next Sunday night, hope that you'll be here. Uh, it'll be an abbreviated uh, time for us to be together, and then it'll be mostly spent within fellowship, which is a good thing, too. Uh, we can't ever have too much of that. Uh, so we're going to get through verses 1 through 7 uh, tonight. It's uh, Normally, if we were undertaking, uh, just as a congregation, the process of selecting, then we would probably take these uh, qualities one by one. Uh, but I'm going to group them for the sake of time so that we can uh, continue to move on. But we'll ask uh, questions as we go. Feel free to ask as we go through this. I'm sure you've read it plenty of times, been in study, so I'm sure you have a lot to offer in of itself. Uh, one thing that I would ask, we're going to read the section in just a minute, but one thing I would ask as we read it is to read it through this perspective, and that is Timothy is not asked, nor is the church at Ephesus asked, uh, to select elders. They already have them. This list is not provided so that Timothy and, and the church can go out and select the men that God wants. They've already got leaders. So that puts it in a little bit of a different perspective. Most of the time when we read this passage, it is because we are proactive. We're about to do something. It's not the way it is. We, for in a rare moment as a congregation, uh, actually can put ourselves in the shoes of Timothy. We have an established leadership. This is to look backwards. This is to look at where they are. If you want to look forward, especially for those of us that are men, looking at these qualities with uh, four uh, men to be um, to be leaders, and as we read these, um, not every man can be a leader. Very selective in this, and and very selected in that. So just those couple of those things in your mind as we read them. So let's read them together. We'll read the first seven verses. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert. Or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now, this isn't the only passage. Uh, Titus has one in Titus chapter 1, 1 Peter 5, and the first couple of verses there also speak of shepherds. Uh, you can bring those in in your own study if you will. We're going to just stick with, uh, with our text as we go through this. Uh, so this first quality that is mentioned is this quality of being above reproach. And I'm going to emphasize numerous times that not only this word or this phrase, but throughout the entire list, and that includes Titus and that includes Peter, do you not find the word perfect? A lot of the time we think we've got to find perfect men. Don't exist. And when he was here, we killed him. So we're not looking for perfect men. So even above reproach does not mean perfect. It does not mean someone who is sinless. It doesn't mean that someone who's got everything together, that every decision that they are going to make as a group is always going to be 100% perfect. That does not exist. And yet sometimes we as members can come across as if that should exist. That doesn't need to exist. It can't exist. It's impossible. Doesn't mean though, doesn't mean that we let things go either. So this above reproach, it's used in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 17, used also in chapter 6 and verse 14. So we'll see this phrase again within the letter as we go through our study. And it has to do with moral conduct, it has to do with morality. Most of the time when you see this in the New Testament, this phrase will have that as its backdrop. So if you have the New King James Version, if that's what you're using tonight, you will see the word blameless. You'll see the word blameless. Again, 
I, I understand probably why they settled on it, but it gives in English the idea that this is a perfect individual. He is blameless. Now, that doesn't exist. Uh, but when it comes to his moral conduct and who he is and the quality that he is to have, that he aspires in such a way to live a high moral life. So he's blameless, uh, above criticism, or without fault. Uh, this word would be used of Zechariah, the father of, uh, of John the Baptist. He and his wife were blameless before the Lord. They weren't perfect, but when compared to the word of God, they live closely to what's there. So again, we're not looking for just any individual when this happens. And when Timothy is comparing this to what exists, this is something that he needs to look at. And if so far, if you had to say with the context in our study thus far, Timothy's existing leadership, existing leadership in 1 Timothy, are they above reproach? No. With what we've studied so far, We've seen some very distasteful uh, uh, qualities. And one of the things, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, these qualities will either be a complement to an existing leadership, or they will be an indictment. And for Timothy's leadership, and for the leadership of the church at Ephesus, it actually serves as an indictment. Because they are not above reproach with the false gospel they have, with the greed they have, the controversy they have, uh, the list could go on and on and on. So in this quality, looking at this quality, why this one? Out of everything you would start with, purity, holiness, other, other words that we could wrap our minds around, why would Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, start the whole thing with above reproach? Adam? Their life is a testament to the character of the individual. Okay, so the, the life, the actions. We're not talking about words, even though that could probably fold into it. You don't want immoral words coming out. But if you didn't hear Adam, it would be a testimony, a testament to the type of life he has lived and is currently living. Again, you're not looking for a man who's above reproach. Then he gets into the position and now it doesn't matter whether he is or not. You continue on in that life. You continue on in that type of life. What else? Why else would Timothy, uh, would Paul start with this quality of above reproach? It goes on and he says later, not a novice or, or it has to be older. So he's got a history. He's got a life of history of a way of living. He's also interacted with people both of the faith and out of the faith. Okay. And they think of him as the same person. Okay, that's a good point. So this bookend of this list will, end, if you didn't hear Tom, it will end that he has a good reputation, essentially. That's Elisha's word. In the Christian community, but then also in the non-believing community, non-discipleship non community. And how does he have that? More than anything, it will come to the morals that he holds. It will come to the morality that he practices. David. Um, I would answer your question and say that because we're really good at picking people apart, and if you show something reproach that, that is reproach, people are going to go after it. If you're an existing okay. elder, and I know you're not talking about new, but it would be true of new as well. It would. No, absolutely. It would be somebody whose name is put forth. It would be someone who's new. It would be somebody who's existing, somebody who's been in there for a little while, whatever that time frame may be. Yeah, and, and the other thing, if you think about it too, if, if, and this is based on the, the words that we looked at a couple of weeks ago with the names, they are the tip of the spear when it comes to protecting the congregation. What happens when you're, I don't like using this terminology, but I, I know you'll follow it. What happens if the outer defenses are already weak to begin with from a moral standpoint? Your elders are your, your outer defenses, right? Guard the sheep, watch the sheep. So it's not just the picking of the part, but then if that's already weak, which is what's happening in Ephesus, there's a weak one. And of course, they're weak because of a false gospel and other things. But nonetheless, it's still, uh, it's still there. One quick thing to notice, uh, verse 2, they, these are not suggestions. This is not advice. 
An overseer must be. This can't be, the church can't go undertake this and say, well, maybe, maybe not. We don't get to approach this from a suggestion standpoint. This isn't even our our moms and dads to us as, as adult children that would say, I highly suggest this. No, these aren't highly suggested items. These aren't, if I were you, I would probably do this. It's none of that. It is a, it, it's a must, as, as it's translated. Tom? I never, I never had thought about it the way you said it about this is something that they already have. Are we assuming that this was taught and they installed elders with these qualifications? Or did they install elders and realize those are the wrong people? No, it, the assumption is, is that if this is what's used in the book of Acts. When Paul goes around at the end of the first missionary journey, uh, he and Barnabas and, and others establish elders. These are there. Uh, this is just the first time they're actually written down. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and don't forget, they have the Hebrew scripture as well. So they're still going to use that as a foundation like Ezekiel. The passages we've already kind of looked at. Uh, so no, this isn't, this isn't created in response to what they're doing. This is already there. This is just that leadership in Acts 20 and verse 28, just fulfilling the prophecy that he had that some of you will do this, unfortunately. Uh, but Timothy's got to he's got to try to put these things in in order. Go ahead. I just thought it was interesting, but it might be true. <coughs> that Greek word is only used three times in the whole Bible, but it's all in this book. It's once about elders, once about widows, once about Timothy the preacher. Yep. <coughs> yeah. And that is not a coincidence. That no, <laughs> no, and and um, I mean, you sit with it for a little while out of twenty-seven books. Why in this one? But it has to do something with the current leadership and the the attitudes and the spiritual nature of of where the spiritual condition of where they're at, and just really on the wrong side of the tracks of things. Uh, so Timothy. He's got to take a position that God didn't, God didn't design for him to have, but because this isn't happening over here, we're going to have to just, you're going to have to take care of this. But Timothy, you can't be this way either, right? And when, when he says later on, um, don't let anybody despise you for your youth, he's using this. I don't think, I don't think he uses it in that text. You may, may correct me if I'm wrong, but he has that as a backdrop. Be an example to the believers. Be an example to the people because the examples they've got are, are, not, are not living up to what they're supposed to have. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The next one is the husband of one wife. By the way, uh, depending on if you read commentators, you listen to this stuff, I don't know kind of how much you branch out. You should just a little bit. But some would say actually that this is the only quality. And that everything else is kind of an example of what above reproach is or is not. I thought that was a unique way of looking at it. I don't think, I don't espouse to that, but I throw it out there for you for your consideration on that. So above reproach, if you're keeping count, that's number one. But right off the bat, right the very next one, the husband and one wife. And I know when you've studied this before, even since I've been here, you know this. It's literally a one woman man. That is literally what it means. That is how it's, if, if you were to just put it as a wooden, kind of rigid translation, that's what it would mean. Now, I know we would like to go down side roads of what about this or what about that. Just for the sake of time, the whole purpose of this is to emphasize faithfulness. That's the purpose. This statement exists. So that the quality of this man, not, the char- not just the qualification. Again, if we're just thinking, oh, he's married, that's fine. You can be married and be unfaithful. It's the faithfulness of this man. It's the quality that he has. And the question would be is, why does that matter for an overseer? Why does that matter for a shepherd? That his quality of faithfulness that's in a marriage, and he's using this, so you're gonna, you can hear the echoes of Ephesians 5 in this. Why does faithfulness matter? Why does the quality of faithfulness matter with a person being in leadership? It goes to the first uh, 
<coughs> which is above reproach. Okay. He is not the type of person that's get, given to womenizing. His moral standards is unfaithful to you. Yes. You so, yeah, so if the, if the above reproach means, and it does, from a moral standpoint, then the first idea of that morality is, is how is that laid out from a, 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 a sexual point of view, from a physical point of view? Go ahead. Okay. All right, so that's the other backdrop is this, that, and this is our understanding, shepherds, again, Paul will say it, how can he, be, how can he manage or, or, or take care of God's church? It's not even his just his for a little while. It's just that group, however many it may be. If you can't be faithful to someone you do see, how can you be faithful to someone you can't see? If you can be faithful to someone you do see every single day, you made your promises, so forth and so on. How can you be faithful to someone you've never seen? This is John's argument in 1 John. How can you hate your brother who you do see but say you love God whom you've never seen. And John would say that, that just doesn't happen. But the same concept is here. How can a man be faithful to God who he's never seen, but not to his wife? Not to his family? What else? Why, why else would this quality matter? What is an eldership entrusted with? Okay, souls. When a woman marries a man, what is she entrusting him with? Her soul, her life, her children. Right? All of this is coming down the line. I, yes, promises and all of that. But this future, I'm entrusting this present and this future with you. I'm entrusting the growth of this family. I mean, you know, so forth and so on. Things that are non-verbally communicated, but they're there. This is what I'm doing. A full, well, God is entrusting to a group of shepherds souls. A church bought with the blood of Christ. Not with promises and not with rings and not with an elaborate ceremony, but with blood that was shed on a cross. And I'm putting in them in your hands. Be faithful to them. They are yours for a little while. If you can't take care of your family... By faithfulness. And it's, it's not just from the physical, intimate point of view. It's faithfulness in everything. Can you be faithful with the gospel? Can you be faithful with the good news of Christ? Can you be faithful with grace? Can you be faithful with mercy? Can you be faithful? What does God's family need? It doesn't need money. It needs grace. It needs mercy. It needs the gospel. I mean, shepherds should be the tip of the spear to promote that. You are entrusted with this. And the state of the congregation, this congregation is built on the shepherds who have come before it. And this congregation will be built on the shepherds that are now, the elders that are now, as is other congregations. Faithfulness needs to be the mark. That's the point of the one woman man. It's the emphasis on faithfulness. And we lose that when we kind of go through the other. I'm not saying that the other questions don't need to be answered Asked and answered. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But when we answer those, don't miss the overall point that it's about being faithful. Is that man faithful? Does he have the quality, not the qualification, but the quality of faithfulness? Does he live up to, the, to what he's given? Uh, so here's where we're going to start grouping things. Okay, we're going to start grouping them. Uh, Sober-minded and self-controlled. Sober-minded and self-controlled. Uh, so some of you have a version that would say tempered. You got a version that says tempered. So literally it would mean wine less. He, he, he uh, practices abstinence when it comes to wine. But it also means this, sobriety in life. It's not just sobriety in terms of alcohol or any type of controlling substance. We kind of just kind of tunnel vision our way there. What happens if he lives a life of excess? Can you be drunk in other ways in this life and not have any alcohol or type of drug in your system? You ever heard he's drunk with power? 
right? There's those concepts. This is what that is. So it's not just the idea of being wine less, but it's also just sobriety in life from, uh, and free from excess and clear minded. And if you look at what we've been able to piece together, one of the last qualities of the existing leadership that Timothy has in Ephesus is sober mindedness because they're drunk with greed. They're drunk with greed. Well, why? What happened? They want more. And is that not the very definition of excess? And then, of course, self-control also means prudent. Some of you may have a version that says they are prudent. They are prudent in the way they're sensible, they're balanced in their life. So, again, you notice the pattern. Why these qualities? It is. It is. It does. Yeah. And that's again why some think that above reproach is the only qualities. Here's just an example of a man who is above reproach. He's prudent. He's sober minded. He's self controlled. We treat him individually, which is probably a good approach as well what we're doing, but you could look at it like you're talking about tier one, tier two, tier three, if you want to look at it that way. Why else would these qualities matter for a man, whether he's existing in, as an existing leader or whether he's up for that position? Why would, the, why would these matter? Okay, absolutely. Uh, as our men could attest to, and anybody who's ever served in that position, or even just family-wise, even if you just take family, mom and dad every now and then have got to make monumental decisions that are going to chart the course of the family. Not all the time, but there are times. And that's, that, part, that comes part, uh, part of the package when it comes with, with an eldership. What else, though? Okay. Yourself, whether you're an elder or not. Okay. So again, this is, most of these qualities are for all of us. It's not like this is a special set of qualities. All of us should aspire to have uh, sober mindedness and self control. Jeff? Well, when you're in self control and you're sober minded, you're, you're able to be objective ah. and not let emotion sway you. Okay. Okay, that's a good, good description. If you didn't hear Jeff, what he said that if you have these, both of these, so it's not one or the other, but they're both working almost in tandem, you're able to be objective with whatever it is. Fill in the blank. A person, an issue, a decision. You're able to be objective and you're not swayed one way or the other, which is huge. Objectivity is huge. Uh, because you're a human being, you can easily get swept up in that. It just happens. It's not, again, nobody's fault. But if you can have that, if these qualities can temper you, that's a good way to look at it. Can you think of anything else? How about this? So we keep saying that it's a current, this is the existing leadership for Timothy. I know it's not written, but I'm going to just read in between the lines, so I'm going to take a little bit of freedom. That means that Timothy is most likely going to have, a, have, to, have to have a conversation with one or some of these men, wouldn't you think? Will they be objective enough to hear? This time, the objectiveness is not them being proactive, but listening to a young man, Timothy, and coming in and saying, guys, we got to fix things. Can they be objective enough to hear? Can they be sober-minded enough to hear? Can they be self-controlled enough to hear what comes their way? How is Titus, just put Titus, how is Titus going to put things in order if men are not willing to listen? How, how many of us can reason with someone who is out of control, whether it's emotions, Jeff, you mentioned emotions, but in any sense, how many of you have found it easy to reason with someone who's been swept up in whatever it is. Think of the task that Timothy's got in front of him. 
he's got to talk to thee. I mean, this is, this is being read in, t- in front of the entire congregation. And I'm pretty sure that Timothy's got to talk with these men behind the scenes. I'm sure of that, because Paul has left Timothy to do that. Are they objective enough to hear that they have not been shepherding the way that God has intended? And are they in self-control enough to not lash out to him, but objective enough to hear? It's going to hurt, but are they objective enough to hear that? That's the context where Timothy finds himself. And how many times have we tried to talk with leaders, perhaps, in the past, and there's no objectivity? Go ahead, Adam. The most difficult thing for a caroose, the preacher, is to set himself apart from the eldership. He has to be free will in his speaking the word of God. Mm-hmm. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, preach the word in season, out of season, rebuke. Mm-hmm. And there's the context. He lays down these things that the preacher must do because he is accountable to God just like the elders are accountable to God. Sure. For the message that he speaks. And he can't talk in that message. Mm-hmm. He has to hold people accountable <coughs> for their actions, even if it's an elder. He has to do that as a spokesman for God. Yep. And we'll see Timothy, uh, Paul give Timothy in chapter 5 some instructions on how to do that. Uh, but this speaks of the quality. If that man has that quality, it's still hard. It's still hard, but it may lead to more success than failure. But this is the same for all of us. We should have the quality that if someone comes and talks to us, that we don't just turn on a dime. That as hard as it may be to hear what somebody has to tell us, we need to hear what they have to tell us. But so many times we lose our objectivity and we just gone. This person blank. This person blank. And we don't hear it and we are not sober minded. And we are not in self control. Uh, respectable and hospitable are quality. So this respectable means orderly or disciplined or honorable. So again, we're seeing these things. What Adam has pointed out, again, they're tied to this above reproach. They're not separate. They're not um, uh, separate from each other. Hospitable. He's generous. He's friendly. He's willing to share. So these are obvious. I'm just giving us some softball questions. Why these? Why these qualities? Yes, ma'am. Yes. But if it's only a hello and goodbye, you don't know them. Mm-hmm. You see them. Yeah. So the hospitality would not necessarily be material things as much as just time no. is what's shared. Very important. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Jesus says in John 10. You know, they, they, I know my sheep, but they know me because they know my voice. It's that familiar sound. And as far as the respectable is concerned, that's really the authority that, and you mentioned a minister, but that's what was hammered, I'm sure, in, in school when you went, Adam, and it's the same for myself. What, what you carry into here, the authority, obviously, is God's word, but the next thing is if you're not respected, you're done, right? It's so a, a respectable type of life, but that's tied in to above reproach, so forth and so on. Uh, that's where that authority, that it's, it's, it's tied into. Um, this next, this next uh, quality, he's able to teach. Some of you got apt to teach. Uh, so in this, it's two concepts that are brought out. 
So one is the knowledge. He's got competence. He's knowledgeable. Okay, so this goes to that novice aspect that we see. But he's knowledgeable. He's competent. So he, he can got the knowledge. He's competent enough to put it together. And he's got the skill. It doesn't mean that it's, it's a skill that he goes and goes to school and refines. Time allows him to, to develop this skill. This isn't a you know, trained individual who goes and spends six, seven, eight years in this. Uh, he's got to work. He's got a family. That's not going to happen. But what he does behind the scene is that he increases in his knowledge, increases in his competency, and he's got the skill to be able to communicate that. Uh, if you want to know what this would be, 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, let, a, let the elders who rule well, let them be worthy of double honor. That ruling well, that is specifically let those who teach well. It's not just that they rule in terms of making a decision from on high. They are down and they are teaching. They are doing that. A couple of other things. Why this quality? Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is something you want to look at. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4, verse 6, verse 10. All of these are there. Uh, why this quality? Yes, ma'am. Okay. They are. Okay. All right. So in the yeah, in the from behind the scenes, there needs to be an active preparation. And what? How do you prepare? Come here and invite. Let me teach. Yes. You know. Yes. I think this also applies to teaching. I agree. A person might have the skill, knowledge, and the ability and not be willing. Mm -hmm. Or it may be a person who has taught long ago and has stopped. Mm -hmm. Are they still willing? Are they still able? Yet many places we make them leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it ends up showing. It ends up showing, which goes back directly to what Maybell said in terms of the preparation. If, if we're busy behind preparing, by preparing yeah. then we won't feel the temptation to force into that. Why else would this matter, Terry? It is. It is. And, and I know when we see this, and, and all of that is, is right and true, and we normally, our mind immediately goes to a public setting, a class, uh, you know, something, something in the building, something when we're together. But you know, an elder teaches when he goes and finds a member who's been wayward. And, he, and he's sitting at their dinner table. Or they are. I shouldn't say he, but they are. They're sitting at the dinner table. Well, why are you sitting here? Well, the Bible says. 
know, X, Y, Z, whatever, you know, something of that nature. Uh, Justin? In, in some of the cases that we see, we kind of talk about this, but in like Corinthians 5, or when you read that yep. one, there's all sorts of mess going on in the church there. And then here, there seems to be a lot of issues. And so maybe some of those things wouldn't get to the point where they were these big public <coughs> ordeals had the elders been doing okay. what they should have been doing in the first place. Sure. And teaching individuals, maybe in this private setting. Instead, it kind of metastasized to this big thing. Mm -hmm. and, and now it's out there. And still, like in Corinthians, still nobody was doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so Paul steps in. Whatnot. So, and then Timothy, I'm guessing, because they're already established, they also weren't following through on what they should have been doing. Most likely, yeah, yeah. So, I, I know that now, you know, the congregations I've been part of, sometimes you see elderships take a larger role in the, the teaching and things like that. Or if there's an issue, you see them in a more public setting. They'll handle. Is that the expectation that Paul has for the elders? Is that what he's telling Timothy to instruct them? And, and the idea of apt to teach is not just that you're capable of teaching, because I think everyone's sort of capable of teaching, but you are willing to teach. When you see an issue, you're willing to step in and do something about it. I, I think that's a challenge for everybody. Yeah. I would say that, that last part, it goes with, with what he mentioned a second ago in terms of that desire, so he's still still there. Uh, the thought would be yes to your question, is that, that what they needed to do, so Ephesus is where they are right now, because those who should have been teaching are now teaching something completely different. So not only are they not faithful to the gospel and sound doctrine, but now they are, they, they are swept over with the other. So Timothy's got to do that. But the expectation would have been whoever was, it's not the entire group is bad, but the, those who are good, I guess you could say, for lack of a better, would have gone to those men and said, guys, you're, this is not right. If that's the idea. Yes, that there would be a proactive nature because that's guard the flock, shepherd the sheep. These are active, not reactive type of things. So what you're, so what you're asking that I answer that? Okay, that would be the idea. Um, but Timothy, but either way, even if it's not, Timothy, you go do this. And then, yes, you instruct as you go along the lines. And Timothy comes in. And at some point, the thought is, is that Timothy just, again, using our words, lets go of what Paul has empowered him to do. And he goes back to being the evangelist. Take the gospel, share it, things like that. Uh, so this able to teach is both private and public. And I'm glad uh, you mentioned not just capability, but the willingness to do that as well uh, on that. Very quickly, uh, not a drunkard. So again, you'd want to see not sober-minded, self-controlled. This prohibition is, matches Ephesians 5. Don't be drunk. You know, don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So if you wanted a match on that, you could have that as well. Uh, there's a threefold not statement. Uh, you could throw in the not drunkard, but that's a separate part that probably benefits. Not violent, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. You see Paul just rattle these off. Uh, and the idea would be, why not these? Because when he has to go, whether it's public or private, when they have to go and teach, you don't want to force, you don't want to come across as just this mean-spirited individual or group. You don't, want to, you don't want the conversation. If you're trying to correct it, you don't want it to de-evolve into a quarrel, into a fight. But if you've got this quarrel nature or quality, that's not going to work. Lover of money, well, that's, a, that's an indictment of the group itself in Timothy. They are what they are because they love money. And if you look throughout the letter, that's, that's a huge piece there. Instead, what's fascinating, Tom doesn't allow us to do this, instead of three positives, he gives us three negatives, but instead of three positives, he just gives us one quality of gentleness. Quality of gentleness. You know where that quality is found? In Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is yeah, 
gentleness, and self-control. What's fascinating, if you wanted your own, is to take the fruit of the Spirit list, and you'll find just about every one of them in this list. We've already covered self-control. We've already seen love. You have it in other places as well. Verses 4 and 5 is the family. Why does the family life matter? That's his Petri dish. That's his family. And, and Paul states, if he can't take care of his family, can't lead his family, how can he take care of God's church? I like how the English Standard Version, because it's, a, it's just a sharp reminder, we don't belong to each other in that regard. We belong to the one who bought us with the blood. And those leaders, the leaders that we have, do the same thing. So he manages, so it's governing, leading, giving direction. It appears two times in these two verses. Manage his household, manage his children. Uh, children, so how does he manage? He does so with dignity. He does so with dignity. A seriousness, a propriety, an integrity, a compassion, a respectfulness. It's not one of those, it's all of that. Everything wrapped up into one word. This is the quality of that, of that elder, uh, of these elders. Uh, so why does dignity matter? I think we know why. Uh, we can't spend a lot of time on it. But we know that. This is a dignified individual. This is a dignified person uh, in that. How, who does he manage? Children. Titus says that they must be believing children. Here in the, in the Timothy passage, they need to be submissive and obedient. Why? Because he's leading them. And the idea is, is and we know this, those of us that are parents, that we parent our children when they're five one way and when they're 15 a different way. Because they've grown and matured. So a shepherd, a group of shepherds know. This goes to Mabel's point. How do you shepherd? You know where they are. And you know what kind of tactic to pull in. You know, I say tactic, you know what kind of approach to take. Uh, but either way, you want a group of people to be submissive to you. Not because you are large and in charge. But because you're helping them know the Lord even more. That's the idea. Uh, and that goes with the respectfulness in that. Uh, not a recent convert. I think that makes sense. But it's interesting that Paul tells us, just in case you didn't know, two reasons. You can become inflated with conceit, puffed up. You can become a balloon. You look like you're something, but on the inside, you're really nothing. That's what a balloon is. On the outside, it looks great. And on the inside, it's nothing. He gets inflated with conceit. It's interesting. You fall into the condemnation of the devil. The devil, that's not the last time he appears. He's well thought of of outsiders. Tom mentioned this earlier. Why? Not to fall into disgrace or snare the devil. I'd be curious at some point in time, if you take this a little bit further in your own personal study, why he mentions Satan twice and why does he attach him to those two qualities? I'd be curious to hear your own thought on that. Not a recent convert, because he's inflated with conceit, uh, and that he will be like Satan, or fall into disgrace and a snare of the devil. Uh, this is where we're going to leave off again next week. We'll kind of be abbreviated. We'll pick up with deacons. We're kind of moving through this fairly quickly, not taking some time. A uh, couple of things that I would say as we, kind of, as we close this. Pray for our elders daily. And let's have biblical expectations for them. I, went, I was almost toying with the idea of realistic expectations, but we should have biblical expectations. We should have biblical expectations for our leaders. We should have biblical expectations for each other. And sometimes realistic and biblical don't match up. Do well to have it for yourself. That's a great point. Uh, but pray for them. Let's follow them. Let's make their task easier and not harder. God has given them to us. Leadership is a gift. It is not a burden. We can make it a burden. But I would highly advise that we don't. Let's pray. Let's follow. And when the time comes, whether it's in my lifetime again or your lifetime, whenever it is. When the time comes to select men, this is not a light task. This is not something that we can just make in a span of 24 hours. We need to be praying about this. We need to be preparing ourselves for this. We need to be busy having that, uh, in that in that case. So let's pray for them. And by the way, tell them thank you. Tell them thank you. It doesn't hurt to give a thank you every now and then and to hear one. They do a lot. 
Let's make the task easier. Let's love each other. Let's follow. Let's go to heaven together as we do this. God has a reason for everything that he has uh, and given us, so I can encourage you to keep reading and studying. If you have not had the opportunity to partake of communion, it's been left in the hallway to my right, your left. Someone will meet you there and you can partake of it together. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, you've blessed us with this day, uh, this morning, and this evening with the time to gather together. Uh, we spend a lot of our time studying your word and we're thankful for that. But I pray, Father, that we will also spend the time with fellowship, that we'll find a way to encourage each other before we leave this place, that it will be good to, to tell each other that it was good to see one another, that we hope that each other have a good week. And Father, we pray that you will keep us safe as we go our separate way. Help us and to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world at school and at work this week, to reveal Christ, uh, to extend grace and mercy, to, sh to shower people with gentleness, to not be quarrelsome or violent or given over to lack of self-control or lack of sober-mindedness that we will all aspire to have an above-reproach life. But at the same time, we also know that every sin and every mistake that we have in our life, that we are absolutely powerless to do anything about them. But because of Christ and His blood, we are forgiven of all of them. And we're thankful for that. We pray, Father, that we will walk with you and before you with humility, that we'll never get ahead of ourselves or be inflated or have an ego or pride that is too big, that makes us forget that we are completely and utterly dependent on you. And help us, Father, in humility to recognize that being dependent on you is exactly what you want. And that we, Father, will not, that we will resist Satan and that we will not resist you in that regard. We pray for a greater humility and a deeper walk with you as we go our way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.